to look for, recover, and rethink in light of current historiography, a term paper for a reading class on the lit lore that I took with him during my second quarter at UCLA in 1984. Two or three weeks into the quarter, I was still looking for a paper topic. One day, as I was walking through the aisles of the university research library, I practically stumbled into uh, the two-volume autobiography of Victor Manuel Villaseñor, Memoria de un Hombre de Izquierda, a fascinating but little-known figure in 20th century Mexican history. As Whitby defines it, the concept of a lit lord refers generally to the accumulated knowledge, mythology, and tradition of leaders from national figures to neighborhood caciques. A lit lord concerns neither self-perceptions of the past, the present, and the future. These perceptions are integrated into a life history framework that is crucial to understanding how leaders participate in society. As the leads construct a method of viewing the world, they begin to accept as truth many of their own assumptions and ideas. But seldom, even in writing out a biography, do they make explicit this life history lore. The lead learning sense is witnessed in simple speech traits and physical mannerisms, captured and tested in biographically oriented oral history, and reflected in the complex images of literature and film." End of quote. Other than the fact that it was an autobiography of a Mexican elite politician, I had no idea whatsoever how, how I was going to apply a lead lord to the analysis of Villaseñor's memoirs. But as I advanced my reading of Villaseñor, it finally struck me. <coughs> After resisting tenaciously for a few years in his opposition to what he considered the right-wing uh, drift of the post-Cárdenas administrations of Ávila Camacho and Miguel Alemán, Villaseñor had joined the ranks of many leftists of his generation in surrendering to the priista authoritarian regime style of pan o palo. Se trataba, mi juicio, de otro más vendido cooptado, que claudicó, o como se dice coloquialmente, que chaqueteó. So my main point back then, in my days of casi radical graduate student at UCLA, was to prove that despite his future efforts at self-justification or self-deception, Villaseñor had ultimately given up. In the end, as usual, he had been seduced and vanquished by the priesta regime. It seemed to me at the time that more than an ideology, Villaseñor's revolutionary status nationalism was an elite loric resource for self-deception and self-justification. A set of beliefs and symbols available for co-opted left leftists like himself that had given up on the goal of the real revolution. That is a genuine, full-blown socialist revolution. Somewhat naively, I thought I had discovered a new field of elite lore under the term cooptation lore. In my view, it was a perfect one for examining underlying processes of elite justi self-justification and self-deception. Cooptation was, and I believe continues to be, a long-standing issue in modern Mexican political history, both during the Porfiriato, remember, ese gallo quiere su maíz, and the post-revolutionary period, Álvaro Obregón's cañonazo de 50 mil pesos, appeasement included co-opting potentially destabilizing military and political rivals, as well as opposing intellectual figures. As I reread my paper, I thought about a different issue that had not been in my thoughts and concerns neither back in 1984 nor when I began thinking about rewriting it a couple of months ago. That is the problem of what we, we may call scholarly, student, or and professor lore. <laughs> in other words, what I have in mind are the conscious but informal beliefs of the historian or researcher. So let me start with some brief reflections on this important issue, what we may call the elite lore of elite lore. <laughs> Somewhere in the idea of elite lore, lies the notion or premise that the scholar is or must become a neutral observer, interviewer, reader, or listener, 
free from his own lore if he's to succeed at least to some degree in uncovering the other elite's lore. This, of course, requires quite a difficult exercise in introspection or auto-analysis. In his 1973, by now manifesto, Wilkie points out the advantages of the oral interview open conversation format for identifying not only the biases of the interviewee, but also of the interviewer. <laughs> but what about those working with written sources, particularly memoirs? Somewhere intuitively, I believe now that perhaps the first step could and should be an, e an effort to uncover and expose one's own elite lore before taking on the analysis of others' self-justifying and self-deceiving distortions of past and present realities. With hindsight of over three decades, I can now detect my own lore an ideology as a Wilkie PhD student at UCLA in the 1980s. No doubt my lore, that is the relatively unsystematic thought about the role of self related to society, an ideology, that is the systematic thought about the organization of society, <coughs> both has, have somewhat changed over the years. Consequently, my self perception as well as interpretation of the same individual, Victor Manuel Villaseñor, and his actor actions in Mexican history are not the same. Surely this is due to changes in my own lore and ideology, but world and Mexican history, as well as time and age, also play an important part. A close reading of Villaseñor's document reveals that as a graduate student with my own lore and under intense academic pressure, I skipped or paid insufficient attention to some important elements in his narrative that even in 1984 would have led me to consider and reevaluate some of the protagonist's crucial decisions and actions in his own historical context. Writing at the time of the art aftermath of the 1982 Lopez Portillo bank, bank expropriation and its defense by important sectors of the left intelligentsia, I'm not quite sure if by focusing on the darker side of Villaseñor, the, the co-opted Mexican leftist, my point was to express a growing disappointment with what I saw as the character of leftist leaders and militants in ger general, or to show the Mexican priista uh, regime as an insatiable beast or unstop unstoppable juggernaut that sooner or later devoured and digested all opposition found in its way, perhaps in different degrees, both. So let me proceed now to read excerpts from my 1984 term paper, followed by some final retrospective comments and reflections. Theory, cooptation is defined as the process of absorbing some new elements into the leadership of the policy determining uh, strata as a means of averting threats to its existence and stability. Although this process takes place to some degree in almost every political system, in Mexico, in post-revolutionary Mexico, cooptation has been refined to the extent that it's, it is a crucial mechanism in controlling and neutralizing opposition to the regime. Most scholars agree that the priest cooptation pattern has been a major source of the remarkable stability that has characterized Mexico's devel development during the post-revolutionary period. Cooptation in Mexico functions at two levels, group and individual. The groups most frequently co-opted are initially independent labor and peasant organizations and political opposition parties. According to Judith Adler Hellman, individual cooptation of course to a large occurs to a large extent because cooperation and collaboration with the PRI is one of the few avenues of social and economic mobility, mobility open to many people in Mexico. Aside from gra the granting of concessions in exchange of loyalty and opportunity for, for personal mobility, some individuals are co-opted with the hope of changing the system from within. However, as Hellman observes, quote, most co-opted leftists who enter the PRI with the hope of burrowing from within are 
deeply frustrated after a relatively brief association with the inner workings of the government and party and frequently find themselves undergoing a rapid change in attitudes and even in vocabulary. Hellman obtained a testimony of this process from an unnamed co-opted leftist economist in the following manner. He says, when I returned to Mexico from my studies abroad, the only job offering open to me was on a special commission on agrarian problems in the ministry of the presidency. I reluctantly took the job because by that time I had a wife and two children to support and could not afford to fool around launching left-wing study groups and magazines. Naturally, I promised myself that I would do everything in my power to remain consistent with my ideals and to work for change from my position within the government. But very soon I found I was changing. Even my vocabulary and my way of expressing myself was altered. There, rather than call the president Diaz Ordaz, I, I soon picked up the exaggeratedly respectful, respectful El Señor Presidente to all my that all my colleagues used. My vocabulary soon filled with the classic pre-rhetoric. We talk of the ideals of the Mexican Revolution and devoted service and self-sacrifice for the fatherland. I had the greatest difficulty in dropping this language even when I, come ho I came home at night. <laughs> I believe that nothing I was able to accomplish in two years at the Ministry of the Presidency changed government policy in any uh, way at all. To pretend otherwise would be, be, would be sheer, and this is the term he uses, self-deception. <laughs> Most interested scholars have studied cooptation in Mexico by looking at the evolution of different opposition organizations. The process at the individual level, however, has not received sufficient attention. The analysis of an aggregate number of case studies of co-opted dissidents and opposition leaders would serve, in my judgment, to elucidate the complex interaction of objective of, or structural as well as subjective forces and processes involved in both individual and group cooptation. For instance, it is virtually impossible for most Mexican academicians and intellectuals to avoid being directly or indirectly associated with the government, whether as professors at the public universities, as research, researchers in a government sponsor center, or as bureau, bureaucrats, fun, funcionarios in the government itself. The need for employment and for a relatively stable source of income would, would act in these cases as an objective or structural force for cooptation. The changing values, beliefs, as well as the expected self-deception for ego protection in the individual being cooptated would constitute the subjective part of the cooptation process. Even, evidently, an analysis of cooptation within the framework of elite lore would focus primarily on the subjective forces and processes involved in individual cooptation. The study of cooptation law would include the following aspects. First, the gradual assimilation, internalization by the opposition, opposition leader of the ruling elite's myths, values, beliefs, symbols, etc. Second, the gradual conscious and, and half-conscious emulation by an individual being co-opted of the ruling elite's traits, including appropriate tone of voice, mannerisms, style of dress, and so on. And finally, the process of self-deception to justify participation in the government and or abandonment of oppositionist positions for conformity, collaboration, and cooperation with the government. Roderick Camp's study of the elite lore of the revolutionary family is useful for the analysis of the transformation of the co-opted leader's values and beliefs. One may assume that in the process of co-optation, the opposition leader's values and beliefs increasingly conform to those of the revolutionary family. In dealing with this aspect of co-optation lore, however, it is essential to keep in mind the distinction made between elite lore and ideology 
as formulated by James Wilkie, Edna Monson de Wilkie, and Maria Herrera Sobek. In other words, any study of individual cooptation should focus on the transformation of the co-opted leader's elite lord, that is his relatively, his or hers, relatively unsystematic thought about the role of self related to society, rather than, but also including, uh, in some cases, ideology, his systematic thought about the organization of society. Test case. In his volume, in his two volume autobiography, Memoria de un Hombre de Izquierda, Victor, Mayor, Victor Manuel Villaseñor follows the autobiographical, uh, autobiographical tradition characterized by a combination of life history narrative and political ideology, ideological analysis. The Latin American political elites, this, this inclination for writing memoirs may be observed in Villaseñor's confession that he initially disliked the idea of becoming the protagonist of his own book. <laughs> Nevertheless, the heroic myth syndrome frequently found in the memoirs of political leaders worldwide is also clearly reflected in Villaseñor's autobiography. In the prologue, the author justifies his work as a much needed historical analysis of Mexico's problems and as an exemplary political personal testimony for new generations. The task at hand, says Villaseñor, does not proceed from personal vanity as much as from a strong sense of social responsibility and national commitment. Victor Manuel Villaseñor was born into a family of the Porfirian elite on 23 December 1903. Aware of the conservative and authoritarian character of the Porfirian regime, the Villaseñor family supported Francisco I. Madero during the, during, during the outbreak of the Mexican Revolution. His father, Manuel Villaseñor, a high-ranking government official during the Porfiriato, managed to join the emerging revolutionary bureaucracy. Salvador Villaseñor, Victor Manuel's uncle, known as El Bolchevique, because of, of his sympathies for the Russian Revolution and Vladimir Lenin, served as federal deputy in the Mexican Congress during the Carranza administration. The Villaseñors established close personal relationships with several revolutionary, revolutionary leaders of the radical or Jacobin Carrancistia faction, such as Salvador Alvarado and Luis Cabrera. According to Victor Manuel Villaseñor, it was during this stage of his life that his awakening to Mexican, Mexico's social ills took place. This process, this process, Villaseñor explains, was largely a result of his direct exposure to the revolutionary ideas of both Alvarado and Cabrera, which he considers as one of the most influential figures in his early political and ideological development. Villaseñor attended the University of Southern California in Los Angeles from 1920 to 1925, and law school at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor from 1923 to 1925. Back in Mexico in 1926, Villaseñor followed his father's advice to enter the UNAM School of Law, specializing in the legal defense of US investors in Mexico. After graduation, he, however, Villaseñor declined a job offer by the Electric Bond and Share Company and instead joined Luis Cabrera's law firm during 1927-1928 and participated in the workings of the United States-Mexico Mixed Claims Commission from 1929 to 1932. Villaseñor writes in his memoirs that he, this was one of the most crucial decisions of his life and that he never regret, regretted not having worked for a national or transnational capitalist corporation. The Washington years, 1929-1932, had a major impact on Villaseñor's ideological development. During these years, he embraced Marxism as a result, this is quote, uh, as a result of a profound psychic and intellectual reaction to the devastating effects of the crash of 1929 and the beginnings of the Great Depression in the United States. The course of Villaseñor's ideological orientation was also deeply influenced by his close professional and personal contact with the chairman of the Mexican delegation, Narciso Basols Batalla, one of Mexico's foremost Marxist politicians and government officials of post-revolutionary of post Mexico. He became a Stalinist 
during a lengthy visit to the Soviet Union in 1935. The appalling economic growth experienced in the socialist nation at the time when most of the capitalist world was under the severe effects of the Great Depression had a lasting positive impression of the Soviet economic planning system and state ownership of the means of production on him. After his return, return to Mexico, he worked for the Lázaro Cárdenas government as a high-ranking official in the Secretary of the Treasury, headed by his mentor Basols, and he served as president of the Mexican Society of Friends of the Soviet Union. During the 1940s, Villaseñor, intensely disenchanted with the changing political and ideological moderation of the Mexican go government under Manuel Avila Camacho, joined Vicente Lombardo Toledano in the formation of the Partido Popular. In October of 1949, he followed in Basol's footsteps, resigning from the vice presidency of the emerging left-wing party in reaction to the, quote, submissiveness of its chairman, Vicente Lombardo Toledano, to the reactionary policies of the Miguel Alemán government. After abandoning the Partido Popular, Villaseñor devoted most of, most of his time to the Soviet Mexican Institute of Cultural Interchange. But the Lombardista directors isolated and pressured him, pressured him to live. Uh, in brief, by the early 1950s, Villaseñor had been purged and ostracized from the Mexican official left and consequently from the national political arena. As he explains, he clearly sensed an overwhelming, quote, lack of political space and that all roads had been definitely blocked. Aside from political ostracism, Villaseñor encountered growing financial troubles resulting from a decade of political activities which yielded no income while facing the burdens of providing for his wife and four young children. Thus, he began looking for a sufficiently well-paid job that would allow him to ease these economic pressures without giving up his political and ideological convictions. In spite of the relatively favorable economic environment in Mexico for private investment during the 1950s, Villaseñor did not need to mediate for long in order to eliminate from his plans the possibility of joining the business sector, a step that would have implied in his words an outright betrayal of my most fundamental beliefs. After many days of arduous think thinking, he finally reached what seemed to be a way, this quote again, a way out of his dilemma and the right solution his, to his personal and ideological troubles. He would become the manager of one of Mexico's strategic state-owned corporations. Following a cordial personal interview with President Alemán, uh, Aleman appointed, appointed him as head of the National Railroad Car Company, Compañía Nacional Constructora de Ferrocarril, one of the three large factories under construction at the site of an emerging industrial town, Ciudad Saúl, in the state of Hidalgo. In recognition of his managerial and administrative accomplishments, President López Mateos promoted him to the general directorship of the entire Ciudad Saúl industrial complex in 19. 59. Villaseñor remained in this position for another 14 years until his designation by President Luis Echeverria as director of the National Railroads of Mexico in 1972. How does Villaseñor justify his transition from radical communist intransigence to integration and collaboration with the Priista regime? To what, extent, to what extent are these justifications actually based on self-deception. In his memoirs, Villaseñor, fully aware of these important questions, asks his reader to make a conscious effort to just judge his decisions and actions on the basis of his performance as achieve and achievements as director of Ciudad Saúl, whether or not he betrayed his most fundamental ideological beliefs. Other less apparent forms of self-justification, however, are found, are found in Villaseñor's autobiography. The most important of these forms of self-justification is more or less implicit in Villaseñor's perception and interpretation of the role of the state-owned corporation in 20th century Mexican development, Mexican development, 
in tune with official revolutionary revol uh, nationalism, statist leftists usually have considered the state-owned corporation and the expansion of the public sector as a nationalist panacea for the country developmental problems. In view of some of these advocates of state control of the economy, each expropriation, nationalization, and the establishment of a government-owned corporation has been and will be a victory over economic imperialism, the private sector and capitalism, as well as a step forward towards socialism in Mexico. This notion can be traced back to the Cardenista old expropriation in 1938 and became entrenched in important sectors of the Mexican left. The strength of statism in Mexico can be witnessed in the initial enthusiast enthusiastic res response of some intellectuals and politicians, both priestas and anti-priestas, to the then recent na nationalization of the banks by President López Portillo, a clear manifestation, I wrote, of their short-sightedness and indiscriminate consent to state control of the economy. More recent illustrations can be found in their intransigent opposition to the privatizations of banks, telecommunications, steel and railroads, and of course, in their militant defense of Pemex. Holding a Manichaean view of the history of economic development in post-revolutionary Mexico, Villaseñor contends, contends that this history has been mainly characterized by a continuous conflict between two irreconcilable forces. That is, between those in favor of the expansion of the public sector and state control of the commanding heights of the economy on the one hand, and those opposed to the expansion of the public sector and in favor of privatization and the country's domination by foreign and national private capital on the other. Villaseñor argued that this clash does not take place within Mexican society at large, but also within the government and the ruling party. He believed that as director of Ciudad Sagún, his role was to demonstrate that state-owned corporations can be efficiently and honestly operated, thereby bolstering the cause for nationalization and state control of the economy, which in turn would contain the expansion of transnational and domestic private capital. <coughs> for this reason, he referred to the industrial complex as, quote, his humble trench in the struggle for the socialist nation. Scholarly uh, studies tend to negate Villaseñor's rather polar interpretation of the relative roles of the private and public sectors in Mexico's economic development, concluding that in general, the private, the private and public sectors have been complementary rather than competing in Mexico's development. As Raymond Vernon ex aptly explains, the disputants the, dis the dispute over state corporations or the disputants have turned more on issues, this quote, have turned more on issues of ideology and on systems of values, implicit or explicitly stated, than on questions of historical fact. Adding that although, quote, frictions, suspicions, and uncertainties exist, they are not so great as to paralyze participation by either sector adding that it would be wrong to think of Mexican private enterprise as belligerently arrayed. So given time limitations, I'm going to kind of skip some things and just come to the conclusion of my 1984 paper and re my re current reflections on it, OK? So in sum, I write, it is clear that Villaseñor's self-vindicating contention that he remained loyal throughout his life to his most fundamental ideological beliefs by never working to either foreign or domestic private capital is to a considerable extent a result of self-deception for ego protection. Mm -hmm. Likewise, Villaseñor's percep perception of the establishment of state-owned companies as proceeding mostly from Mexico's regime surviving, however weakened revolutionary nationalism and as a victory of the Mexican state over domestic and foreign capital is at best subject to important qualifications. This distortion of the Mexican political and economic reality must be understood as part of a co-opted leader's self-justifying and self-deceiving -de efforts. Okay, so, well, so much for my 1980, 
for paper. <laughs> <laughs> now, looking back, it's clear to me that instead of taking on Villaseñor's invitation or challenge and following through by actually concentrating on the evidence of his performance as state managers, I resorted to the le general literature which discussed from a broader perspective the role of state companies in Mexican capital, capitalist level, development in order to demonstrate that his elitloric and ideological statist nationalist vision was a fallacy. In Marxist ideological terms, false consciousness. In effect, nothing but a self-justifying and self-deceiving sham. Granted, I did examine some of the literature on Ciudad Sagún available at the time, and to my great disappointment, not much was found in other sources that I could use for evaluating Villaseñor's actual record as director. There was literature on labor organization, mainly of an anthropological sort. In other words, what was lacking was a good business history of Ciudad Sagún. Only recently have a few relevant studies appeared based on Constructora's archive and other primary sources now available for research, researches at the Archivo General de, Na, de la Nación. However, I'm not trying to engage in another future round of self-justification, this, this time involving myself. <laughs> <laughs> the memoirs themselves had plenty useful information for, for purposes of the term papers that I basically ignored. A careful reading of the memoirs reveals that to a large extent, Villaseñor wrote a fascinating expose of private and government corruption, mm -hmm. administrative inefficiency, and bureaucracy in post-revolution.